This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of the brand new PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, as well as PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac Community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we have what looks like a, a well-rested Ted Landau on our hands because I don't think he got up early to get an iPad. Ted, did you get up early to get an iPad? No, and uh, to be to be clear, it wouldn't have been this morning in any case, but uh, no, I did not. This is probably the first time I didn't. Uh, so... I'm still feeling the effects, Ted. So, <laughs> uh, you got up early to get one. Well, I ended up getting up at 3 a.m. to order it, and then picked it up later in the day. So it wasn't quite as bad as sometimes, but just the excitement of getting up at 3 a.m. You don't go back to sleep real well. That, that that's a nice treat that Apple let you do that actually to the same day pickup as you as you order. Yeah. Was it a surprise to you? Uh, that's the first time, or one of the first times, I remember seeing it done, and I don't know quite what their motivation was for that. You know, nothing surprises me because the rules change every time they come out with a new product. One day you can, you know, there are times when you could order it to be delivered by mail, and it would come the same day as they went on sale at the Apple Store. In which case, I never understood why anybody wanted to go to the Apple Store and wait online, but that's another story. Uh, other times that wasn't the case; you couldn't order them until the day they were sold. And, and you had to wait days before you got it. And then some days you could have an arrange for an in-store pickup, but it would be the in-store pickup wouldn't be until days afterwards. And now you have this. You know, I mean, the, the only rule is there is no rule. <laughs> so, uh, and I have no idea why Apple does what it does. Yeah, and and you know, trying to outguess it, I wondered if they were concerned that now the iPhone 5s seemed to be and 5c seemed to be a pretty big deal. I wondered if the iPad Air because they weren't releasing the the new iPad mini with Retina at the same time. I wondered if they were concerned that the lines wouldn't be big enough and so they decided not to try to create them. They just decided to try to improve the customer experience a little bit. I don't know, that that's my theory. Yeah, that may be. I, I mentioned that on Twitter that I wondered whether the lines would be less um, because uh, because people would be waiting to see the iPad Mini be before they made up their mind. I didn't think it would be noticeably less, and, and I don't think, or maybe they would have been noticeably less if you had them to compare. But I didn't think they would be so small that you would that you would instantly say, "Oh, this is a problem." That's probably due to the iPad Mini. The line, and, and getting to what you said, yes, I think if there's any rhyme, reason, logic to what Apple's doing, I think it has to do with a desire to have some degree of lines because they know that that's good publicity and bad publicity. If they don't have any lines at all, that would be a disaster, I'm sure, from a public relations point of view. And that, in turn, is also influenced by their supply constraints, how many they have. To, uh, and so they take a look at you know what they expect to sell, where they expect to sell it, how many they actually have in the supply chain, and then they come up with some idea by throwing a dart at a board to, as to as to which thing they're going to do. That's how it works. I've actually been there. <clears throat> to see the dart hit the board, is that it? That's right. <laughs> well, I know my, my local Apple store said that they only had about 15, 18 people in line, but they had a hallway full of boxes with people who had ordered and mm -hmm. for pickups. So they felt like that's one of the reasons there weren't a lot of lines. And I, I don't know, huh. cer certainly made it easier. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an, that's another thing that uh, I, I was calculating when I was looking online at possibly ordering one. How many different iPads Apple had to keep in stock to have just one of every different variation? And it turned out there are eighty different iPad variations. So if you to, for, for, well, there, there's there's whether you get the black or white, which is two. Then there's whether you get um, uh, the particular carrier. If, I think there if there. If, you know whether you get no carrier at all or one of four different carriers. So that's five different variations. So that's two times five is ten. Uh, and then there were was uh, whether what size hard drive you know flash drive you get, which was another consideration. And then um, one, there's one other consideration that's eluding me for now that, that, that played into it as well. Um, and by the time we were done, there were eighty different variations uh, of of iPads. So that's a lot to keep in stock if you want to make sure that you can keep everybody happy. 
You know, I hadn't thought about it that way. I guess I sort of did my, you know, very self-centered math of which one did I want and what were the options and therefore what are my chances of actually getting it. Um, but wow, 80 different versions. That's that's kind of impressive. No wonder I ended up having to go to an Apple store instead of a Best Buy or an AT&T because I wanted the 128 gig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, those those were the ones that were hardest. Uh, I looked on one of those sites that showed availability of of different models in my area, and there was virtually nothing. There were no there were no 128 gigabyte ones at all. So. Yeah, you know, it was sort of a catch twenty two for me. I figured that there wouldn't be that many people that were looking for a 128. On the other hand, it probably meant there weren't not going to be as many 128s as some others. Mm-hmm. So you know, yeah, <laughs> again, maybe there was also. Apple was having trouble with the supply of 128, so it might have been also. Yeah. Well, I got it anyway, so. Yeah. 3, 3 a.m., you know, yeah. pick well, up you, later. It worked. You called, you called Tim Cook, and he arranged it, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Tim, Tim and I are like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mac Notables. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, so you're you're holding out for the mini with Retina, or don't you know? I don't know what I'm doing anymore, Chuck. Uh, this, <laughs> you know, this is a real first world dilemma. I'm sure the people who are starving somewhere can, re- you know, can relate to this, and I'm being ironic, of course. Um, but uh, but I don't recall ever having had such a difficult time deciding what I want to get. Now, first of all, let's be clear. I thought about it, and I don't need a new iPad. I have an iPad three. I was, I'm using it today. I've used it for several hours today. It still works as well as it did last week. Uh, I enjoyed it last week. I'm enjoying it today. It's it's perfectly fine. So um, I don't need a new iPad. Uh, I but as we've talked about many times on the show before, my purchasing decisions and I believe probably yours as well are not entirely driven by need. Uh, they're driven by at least two other things. One, one is desire. Uh, if, it, if it has some fancy new features uh, that I want, I'll, I might consider getting it, even though I don't absolutely need it. And the other is that it's partly my job. And so in order to write about these products, I consider it a business expense. And and, uh, and so I justify it that way. So uh, with that in mind, I decided I was, the time was right to get a new iPad. I didn't get the, the version 4 last year, uh, so I, you know, my iPad still has the old 30-pin connector, among other things. And, and I looked, and I said, well, you know, uh, it's a lot faster, whatever. I decided I'm going to get one. The question was, which one do I get? And I had decided um, before the iPads came out, and I think we may have even talked about it on the Mac Jury show that we did, did uh, a week or so ago, uh, that I'd probably get the Mini. The idea being I already had a full-size iPad. It was perfectly good. I'd give it the Mini for variation. It'd give me a chance to decide which one I like better, and, uh, and then whichever one I like better, I'd probably keep that size going forward when it came time for me to get yet another iPad. and give me an opportunity to try out the Mini. Uh, the only thing that was holding me up was whether or not they would have a retina display. And, of course, the iPad mini, as it turned out, did have a retina display, and so I thought that was going to be, you know, I was going to seal the deal. iPad mini, no doubt about it, here I come. Uh, but then when I actually looked at the specs of the iPad Air, it made it a lot harder. First of all, there's, vir- there's no difference in the internal hardware between the two. So there's no reason to, you know, if you're looking at the processor or anything else, there's no reason to prefer one over the other. It's just entirely a question of the exterior. And in terms of the exterior uh, and what, I guess, then the weight, which is partially the interior too, but basically the physical experience as opposed to the, 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 the tech specs that are inside. Uh, in terms of the weight, the iPad Air, it was a full almost, I think, half pound less than the original one and only like now three-tenths of a pound more than the iPad Mini. And I said, well, for that difference, the advantage of the Mini in terms of weight was a lot less. You know, this whole concept of you want to be able to hold it in one hand to make it convenient for this and that and the other thing, I started thinking, well, maybe maybe the the larger one will be sufficient with that reduced weight. And then it's actually even smaller in dimensions. Even the screen size isn't smaller, as probably many of our listeners know. Uh, the Apple reduced the bezel size so that uh, so that it, it is physically smaller and closer to the iPad mini in size than, than the previous generations were. Uh, and so that again said, so, well, you know, now I can get one that's smaller and still have the larger screen size. I don't have to sacrifice screen size to get a smaller iPad. It won't be as small as the iPad mini, 
but you know, maybe that reduction size is enough to keep me happy. And so then I started thinking, well, do I really want to get a smaller screen size when the iPad Air you know, has, has gone on such a severe diet, so to speak. Uh, and, and so then I started thinking, well, maybe the iPad Air is, is going to make it. So, but I didn't, want it to, I didn't want to rush into it. So I said, you know, I'm going to wait until the iPad Mini is uh, on the shelves, and then I'll go to the Apple Store and hold an iPad Air and an iPad Mini in my hands at the same time and, um, and uh, decide which one I want to get. So that's what I decided to do. It's a it's a good strategy. It's a real good strategy because that way you're not doing it just on specs or speculation. Mm. You'll you actually be able to hold it. I've I pretty much eliminated the iPad Mini. Um, in fact, I have one or have had one. It's on its way to the Gazelle. Um, just I liked it a lot, but mm. it just didn't suit what I wanted to do with it. And it was just a little too, well, not a lot of it was too small for me to to touch type on. Mm-hmm. With the virtual keyboard, so mm-hmm. I I found myself picking up the mini, and it's like, well, now I'll go back to the original iPad, or the I guess the iPad three, excuse me, for for you know, productivity. You know, it's interesting you say that. I've never gotten into typing on on the iPad. It, uh, let me qualify that. I do limited typing on the virtual keyboard on the iPad, and what I typically will be doing is holding the iPad in one hand and typing with the other hand. Uh, with one finger, you know, like like that, um, and, and it's not very efficient. And so I I do it, for, you know, I'll do it if I want to tweet something, for instance, which is just 140 characters, um, or if I'm entering some text in a game or something like that, you know. But but if I actually wanted to sit down and write, say, an article for Macworld on the iPad, which I don't typically do, but if I, uh, in which case, serious typing would be required that one finger wouldn't work anymore uh then i wouldn't use the virtual keyboard at all i would shift to one of those physical keyboards that you can connect to the ipad via bluetooth and uh, so i you know the, the the ability to actually do virtual keyboard typing of any great extent has never been an issue for me i'm not great but i've tried to practice a little bit and i've i've definitely gotten better um and i think i'm faster at that than i am at thumb typing with the iphone um, so it's just one of those that I'm, I'm trying to take the iPad as the device that was as it was intended, and 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 learn how to use it properly because I know that I look at the the kids and what they can do with an iPhone is amazing. What they can do with an iPad is amazing by touch typing on it. So I know well, it can be done, I, and I want to do it. Well, to some extent, I also think it's uh, a, a, a um, issue of the size of your fingers. I have very thick fingers. Uh, comparatively speaking, and for instance, if I try to thumb type on an iPhone, it's next to impossible because mm-hmm. the, the, the ability of my thumb to actually reliably hit the key I want to hit without hitting the key to the left or the right half the time is just not going to happen. Uh, so I, I, I can't use my thumbs on the iPhone. Interesting. So, what color will you get? We have to, you know, if, if you don't know which one you get, we got to go with color. Uh, and even that <laughs> turned out to be difficult. I. I I'm very obsessive compulsive about this sort of. I got the um, white iPhone, the silver one, not the gold one, uh, which which I had had the previous year, and I've been pretty happy with it. But I, I thought about getting the the space gray. That would have been my second choice. And so after I got the white iPhone, I said, well, I'll get the space gray when the um, when the iPad comes out. I have a black black and silver iPad 3 now, you know, and I'm happy with it. And so, and I, again, I sort of like the black color because, as I think we talked about before, I like the way the screen blends in with the bezel when you have the display off. Um, but I've also come to like the white a lot. Uh, and uh, and I like the silver. I think I like silver for the back better than the space gray for the back for whatever reason. It's a minor thing. Um, <clears throat> so I started thinking, well... Maybe, maybe I'll get the white again. I'll probably decide when, after I've seen them in the stores. Uh, and I, in fact, I could go to for the air. I could go to the Apple Store today and, and compare colors. I don't have to wait for the Mini to come out for that. Uh, and, and I intend to do that. But you know, it is, it is interesting. Also, I've noticed if you look at Apple's marketing, if you go to Apple's website and look at their iPad website uh, and any other place where the videos that that they constructed for you know, with Jonathan I, with Johnny Ives, and um, uh, that I would say eighty to ninety percent of the time, it's a white iPad that they're showing. Uh, for they they. 
maybe they're just thinking photographs better. It has nothing to do with the color preference. But for some reason, the, the white one is the one that they almost always show. And I think, unfortunately, I think that has some influence as well. After see, after seeing the white all the time in the marking materials, so I start thinking, oh, white's better. <laughs> a little bit of, of hidden persuasion there. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. I've noticed the very same thing, Ted, and I wonder if it's because the, the dimensions of the picture are are much more clearly defined on the white. I mean, I prefer the black for the same reason that I want a television with a black bezel. Mm-hmm. You know, or because I've, I've I've seen televisions with silver bezels and you know other colors, and it frankly you know it, it detracts in my opinion from the viewing experience. So that's why I've always gone with the black iPads. But mm-hmm. I, I also have to admit, I, you know, you look at the white, and it looks nice, and maybe I'm feeling the same tug of Apple marketing mm-hmm. doing the same thing. But uh, I, I could also I also know that whichever one I decide to get within a week or so, it won't matter. Which you know I I can't imagine getting one of them and then say, oh my god, what a huge mistake. <laughs> I, I wind up liking whichever one I get. It's not a big deal in terms of color. Yeah, it's like picking the color for your next car. You know, you right. you obsess over it. You you right. admire it for a week and then it becomes the thing that drives you around. Big That's deal. Right. That's right. And the fact that, that maybe they didn't have the color you wanted in stock and you had to settle for a different color, you don't even think about that after a while. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll be anxious to see what your final decision is. No, you won't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could hardly care. I yeah, know. no, I do care because I want to know what the what the deciding factor will be once you actually put them in, in your hands. I think that's well, going to be well, very uh, interesting. Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know that it will be all that interesting. It's not as if. It's not as if I'm going to have some amazing rationale for my decision that will then drive the purchasing decisions of the rest of the Mac community or something like that. But uh, it's just going to be my personal preference. Yeah, you never know. You could come up with something brand new. Yeah. Could, yeah. So, so, Ted, how has the, uh, how's the Mavericks transition been for you? Because that's the other big thing that happened since we were together last. Yeah, it's been great, actually. I, I installed Mavericks. Uh, I actually installed Ma- uh, the developer version of Mavericks on my MacBook Pro before it was released uh, publicly and re- installed the public version on my main machine, my Mac Pro, the day it was out. And they have performed almost flawlessly. I mean, there, there are a couple of glitches I've had to contend with, but for a 1.0 release, so to speak, uh, you know, 10.9.0, really. Um, it's it's about as solid as I can ever recall an operating system being. So I, I, I think it's really good. We always turn to you for troubleshooting tips. And mm-hmm. it's I'm hearing that Mavericks is not doesn't require that much in the way of troubleshooting, at least so far. But uh, what tips do you have for us when something does go wrong? Because you know sooner or later we're going to have some issues. Yeah, well, there. You know, I, I did, uh, as I think you know, post uh, an article on MacWorld's website, my bugs and fixes com last week was on dealing with um, uh, Mavericks troubleshooting, and I sort of scoured the web looking at all sorts of different websites and Apple community support forums and so on, trying to see what people were complaining about, and and there were a number of things, uh, but again, for me, they were all minor. And, and, and even when they weren't that minor, they were, they were easy workarounds while you waited for the more permanent fix to occur. I mean, for instance, uh, people initially um, noted when Mavericks came out that text expander seemed to break and wasn't compatible with, with Mavericks. But it, it, that's sort of partially true. It, it turns, uh, and I think uh, Smile is probably working on an update to resolve that. But in the meantime, there's an easy workaround, which involves going into a system preferences file, a uh, system preferences uh, item, the, uh, the, pri- the privacy one, the accessibility, I think, um, uh, in the security system preferences. And there's a setting there, it's detailed in the article, many of your listeners probably already know about. It. There's a setting there that you can enable text expander in. Uh, and then text expander works. So even though you might call it a, a third-party incompatibility or a bug somewhere um, that will eventually be remedied, you don't have to wait for the remedy to get text expander to work again. So that's what I mean by being relatively minor in, on, on a scale of things. It's so a good and the bad with Mavericks. Uh, uh, the the good is that Apple introduced support for multiple displays, which by which I mean that for the first time. You could have each display be a, a, a sort of full citizen. You could have the menu bar on the display that you want. You can have the dock appear on the display that you want, which was interesting all by itself, actually. The, the, it wasn't immediately obvious. Well, let me sidetrack here again for a second. We'll get back to multiple displays. It wasn't immediately obvious to me how to get the dock to appear 
on uh, on the second display. And it turns out it's relatively simple. You All you had to do was move your cursor to the second display and drag it down to where the dock would normally be, and voila, the dock pops up uh, and disappears from the other display. And so you can just switch the dock back and forth between displays uh, in that fashion. You might have thought, if you hadn't tried that, that the way to move the dock from one display to the other was just sort of like drag it, like you do with a window, dragging from one display to another. But that doesn't work. Uh, and that gets to a general minor little complaint I have about Mavericks and also iOS 7 to some extent. And that is that there are a lot of things that have changed in a, in a non-intuitive, non-standard way. That is, the, what, what you would normally expect to have something to work doesn't work that way in Mavericks. And there's very little documentation to get you around it. Uh, something actually that I also covered in that article um, that as a prime example of this were, were tags. There, there, there's a new feature in, in the Finder of Mavericks called Tags, where you can tag a, a file. It's sort of like a fancy version of labels that has previously been in, in, in other versions of OS X. But now you can tag a version with text names and search on those text names, so like, like you can do on, in, in certain websites that have tags. And so uh, you can tag a file, you know, it could say Chuck Joyner and Mac Notables and and Macs and iPhones and whatever, and have all those tags there, and then I can just do a search in Spotlight um, for those tags, and it will will show me the files that have those tags. Well, two things I noticed right away. One is it wasn't obvious in some cases how to search for tags. Uh, it, it turned out that particularly uh, in the in the um, Command F window that opens up in the find the finder that opens up the find window that opens up that way. Uh, I had to type in the word tag with a colon uh, to reliably uh, then follow that with the text of the tag, or it wouldn't necessarily search for tags. There were other ways to get to it, but but that was a way that I couldn't didn't see any documentation from from Apple. And another example of that was if you had a list of tags and you decide that you didn't want one anymore, you know, maybe I'm fed up with Chuck Joyner and I never intend to use, use that tag again, and I want to delete that Chuck Joyner tag, not that I would ever really do that, uh, but I wanted to delete that Chuck Joyner, Joyner tag from my Mac, you know, how, would, how do I delete a tag? There was no mention of that anywhere that I could find, and in fact, most of the articles on, on Mavericks tagging that I read never mentioned that in, in, in all the details that they went into. I found, finally found one, I forget whether I just tripped over it myself or, or found it in this one article that mentioned it. The, 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 ma the major, I think maybe the only way, that, which is part of the problem, the only way that you can delete a tag is by clicking on the tag name in one of the tag lists, particularly the one that's in Finder's Preferences, uh, and then hold down, hold down your, your um, mouse or trackpad to bring up the contextual menu, right-click, whatever, however you do it, and deleting that tag will be one of the items you can select from the contextual menu. Now, the standard way um, to do that is uh, to have a plus or minus button. Uh, at the bottom of the list of tags, as you know, as is done for adding or subtracting printers from the print and fax system preferences pane, and and adding uh, um, startup items works the same way. That, that and, but they chose not to include those plus or minus buttons for tags for some reason, and again makes it that instead they made it so it's hidden inside a contextual menu. And I and I've read numerous articles uh, on websites dealing with Mavericks and some of the new apps that work with Mavericks, the iWork and the iLife apps in particular from Apple. That that that's a consistent theme. You'll read a review and they'll say, "You may think that such and such a feature is gone, but actually it isn't. It's just that Apple has hidden it in a new location that you wouldn't think to look." And I don't know why Apple has done that. I, I think it's definitely. There seems to be some deliberate strategy on Apple's part to do that because it happens in so many different locations, but I'm not sure what the rationale for that is. Maybe they want to make things look simpler on the surface. I'm not sure. Ted, not knowing, not knowing all the examples, but I'm wondering if there might be some desirability for not being able to easily, even with one or maybe two clicks, delete a tag since... Tags are, are theoretically a whole new way of filing things that you, you don't need to put them in folders anymore. And so maybe they don't want you to delete tags real easily. Is, is, okay. is that fa a fair possibility? I don't buy that. No, they could easily have a thing where you click the minus button that says, are you sure you want to delete this tag? And so, you know, the usual ability to back out of it without too much trouble. I, I, 
I can't believe that Mac users need more help than that uh, in order to not do something that they regret. Yeah, maybe not. But I don't know. And it, it, like I said, it occurs in other places in, as well. In fact, there was a review, I think, um, of Keynote on, on Macworld. Uh, home page today that that has almost exactly that sort of sense where it says uh, this is a feature that I forget what the feature was but something that they said you might think is gone but really isn't it's just hidden um, <clears throat> all right leave that alone well, let's get back to the multiple displays that, that led me on this little diversion anyway so that yes you have this multiple display support the problem is that that all works exactly like I, like I described it all works very well um, but if I like to keep, for instance, uh, my mail program, which is unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon the day, um, Outlook from Office 2011, uh, and I like to keep that open on what I call my second display. Uh, it's there so I can glance over from time to time and see what my mail, uh, current mail is. But, but um, my main display uh, is whatever I'm working on, uh, what article I'm writing or right now talking to you. And the problem is that if I close Outlook for some reason, maybe I want to quit it and relaunch it for some reason, or, or uh, and there are various reasons that I will close Outlook. We don't have to go into all of them now. Uh, but if I close if I close Outlook and reopen it, it reopens in whatever display is is cur is the one that currently has the dock, and there may there may even be other other um, factors that play into it. But so in other words, even though Taking too long to explain this here. You may want to edit some of this. <laughs> um, even though out, the Outlook window is in the secondary display, if I were to close that window and reopen it for some reason, it would open again in the main display, and I'd have to push it back to a secondary display. Uh, and that gets to be annoying after a while. It's, as people have said on the web, the, it doesn't remember where the window was last open. Mm. Uh, and so hopefully that's another thing that Apple will fix in time. Yeah, the, the whole secondary display thing... Uh, the fact that you can now open um, an app in in full screen mode on one display, but not wipe out the other display, is really nice. It, it seems like there just had to be some new rules invented here, whether they are good ones or not, or whether they like the not remembering where you where you're going. I don't know yeah. if that has anything to do with full screen mode, or whether that's just something that hasn't been implemented that maybe should have been. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Hmm. What other what other bugs and well, what other troubleshooting techniques? Maybe I better say it that way for Mavericks. Anything other than what we've had before? No, I don't think there's anything new that's that I can think of that's come up. Um, trying to think, no, not, not much. Um, there's a new command. I think it's new to Mavericks for creating installer. Uh, flash drives that Dan Frakes talks about in his article in Macworld about how to create a bootable flash drive for, 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 for Mavericks. And there's a new command that, that you enter in terminal that didn't exist before. Uh, I can't think of many other troubleshooting things that, that have come up. Uh, the one, one other thing I'll mention though before we possibly get off this topic is that probably uh, among the biggest of the complaints about Mavericks are, is the problems with mail. Uh, and uh, particularly if you use Gmail in, in OS X mail application. And the good news is that Apple is supposedly working on a fix for that. So. Yeah. In the meantime, mail plane or just use it in the browser, and yeah. you'll be a lot happier. I've decided to give up on Gmail, by the way. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, well, I heard you say Outlook, and it's like I, I thought that's something we have to come back to. But why have you given up on Gmail? Well, a couple of reasons. One is I've never used it a lot. Uh, you know, I have my own Ted Landau d domain, and that's the main domain that I use for for my email. I also have an Apple, you know, dot um, uh, uh, dot iCloud dot me whatever account, and I use that. And I'm not sure how, how many accounts do I need. Uh, do I really need a Gmail? And, and I find that I hardly ever use it for anything of, of value. Uh, it's just a sort of dredge account that, that that has a few things that I'm not that interested that come to that account. And it's always, especially in Outlook, even before Mavericks, it's always been an annoying problem, and I think it's partially to do with Gmail servers, not so much an Outlook problem, where every once in a while, even though Gmail has been working fine, a message will pop up and say, 
uh, you know, we don't recognize your password. The password is incorrect. You want to try and enter it again. And I'll try and enter it again with, with what I know is the correct password, and it will reject it. And sometimes it just fixes itself. You know, I, I sometimes I just ignore it and say, who the hell cares? I don't care about my Gmail anyway. Um, and, and by the by the next day, it's fixed itself, and everything is fine again. Or, or sometimes I actually have to go to the Gmail website and log in on the, on the website to get things working again. Uh, regardless, it, you know, that would happen like once every two weeks at, at a minimum. It just got annoying. And then when I started reading about all the problems that Gmail was having with uh, mail, and then I started reading about how, which I hadn't really thought about much before, the, the articles went into how even though Gmail appears as an IMAP uh, interface, it really doesn't use the standard IMAP rules. It's not, it's, you know, it's not really pop. It's not really IMAP. It's, it's Gmail. It's its own genre unto itself, so to speak. And so I started thinking, you know, I don't really need this. Uh, I'm not using it much to begin with. It, it, it has... Uh, what is appearing to be a growing list of problems and reasons not to use it uh, goodbye so that's what I decided to do this edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile the makers of world class software for the Mac, iPhone and iPad Smile has just released the brand new PDF Pen Scan Plus for the iPhone and iPad now you can use your iDevice to scan receipts, documents and more anywhere you are PDF Pen Scan Plus automatically detects page edges and crops the scan to fit, allows you to enhance the scan to be more readable, and adjust scan resolution for color, grayscale, or text. But that's just the beginning. You can also perform optical character recognition, known as OCR, on the document right there, on the spot, to create searchable PDF documents that can then be emailed, exported, or stored in Evernote, Dropbox, and other cloud services. Text becomes selectable and can be copied to other applications, and 16 different languages are supported by OCR. If you thought PDF Pen was essential for your iPhone or iPad before, you will be blown away by the power and convenience of PDF Pen Scan Plus. Get it now at a special introductory price on the iOS App Store, or visit smilesoftware.com for more information. Smile. Great software for your Mac, iPhone, and iPad. Thanks to Smile for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Okay. Well, hey, if whatever works. You know, that's what we always say, whatever works. Ted, the one, one thing I'm curious, and of course with Mavericks being free, I think a lot of people really jumped on the bandwagon and, you know, updated right away. I'm always a little more cautious than that. I don't want to be at least with a production machine right on that bleeding edge. But how did you go about doing the, the upgrade? Did you just install right on top of your existing machine or did you? Oh, yeah. You... Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Okay. Um, you know, I have backups. So oh, sure. if something, something disastrous had happened, it would be time consuming, but not disastrous. So I wasn't too worried about that. And I had, you know, I didn't update well, I guess I did update pretty fast. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't give them much time to wait to see whether people were reporting problems. But but a lot of people I knew had the developer version, including me, and had installed that successfully. And I had not heard about any anticipatory problems that I was going to have. Uh, so I was pretty confident that it was all going to work, and it did. Yeah. Now I, you know, to get to the other aspect of your question, it's almost always better to wait for the ten. 9.1 version than the 10.9.0 version. They're, they're already working on the 10.9.1 version before the release version comes out. And often the 0.1 version comes out relatively fast, like within three or four weeks at most of the initial release. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens here. Um, <clears throat> And that will fix a lot of the bugs that people complained about in the first version. Uh, and the people who waited will then say, phew, that's good. You know, I, I missed out on all those bugs by waiting for the point one version. And I, and I don't see any problem with that. That's great. Um, but I, I said in my Macworld article that I saw no reason, no really big reason to, to do that waiting if you didn't want to. That the as I said, you know, in our start of this discussion, the, the problems with with um, Mavericks are mainly small ones that have workarounds or that only affect a few users, uh, and the typical person will upgrade to Mavericks with relatively no problems at all, in my view. And and so, I, aside from just a sort of standard operating procedure, wait for the dot one release. I see no reason to wait. Yeah, I 
I have to say it's been a very smooth transition. I, I was a little more paranoid than that, but um, given that Mavericks was out there and so many people seem to be running developer versions uh, and openly talking about it mm -hmm. and it didn't seem like there was anything that's like, oh my God, I hope they get this fixed or to wipe out a hard drive. Um, it, I think it was pretty easy to feel secure about this one and good. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's another thing. I don't know where Apple is going with this, but Apple has seemed with each release to be less and less vigilant about enforcing any sort of uh, um, constraint on, on, you know, NDA type constraint on what people can talk about. I mean, people were, you know, posting and images and discussions and, and it, it seemed once the WWDC was over, it just seemed like Apple no longer really cared what people were saying about, about the operating system and where they were saying it. I think they keep the NDA in effect uh, as as a reserve in case for some reason they want to enforce it, but but they really didn't seem interested in enforcing it this time around. Yeah, and it's, it seemed to give a lot of positive buzz to it. Ted, the other thing that we want to touch on, and I know you've been working on this a little bit, is the, the change in file format to the iWork uh, programs, which from what I've seen and a little bit of experience so far, you know, it's creating a few issues for people, especially if they're running older versions on maybe different machines or wanting to share documents with other people. Any any wisdom or that you've you can come up with or anything you found out through your research? No. Okay. <laughs> well, um, that p puts an end to that one. <laughs> that's it. That's it. on to the next topic. It, it's not. It's not a simple topic to talk about. I, I'm working as as you know. I'm working on an article on it, and there is good news. And I try to take a largely positive approach in the article. The good news is that Apple has entirely gotten rid of the multiple file formats that plague pages. In the past, uh, I've written lots of articles on this. Pages, not pages. I work in general. Pages being the example, um, has been terrible uh, in previous iterations for going between Macs and iOS devices. Whereas some, you know, like a like, like a dot txt text document works perfectly well, the same in, in one on one platform or another, and many sp specific third-party apps that have iOS and Mac versions, the same thing is true. For iWork, it has never been that way. Uh, over the years, there were various things you had to do. Uh, there was a time when in order to get a, an iWork document from the Mac to an iOS device, you first had to import it to iCloud. Uh, by dragging it to the iCloud web page from your Mac, and uh, and then and then it would import into the iOS, and it would just give you some warning message about how this file might lose things when you when you opened it up in in the iOS dev device, and so on. And, and there was no true syncing at first; that came a little bit later. But there was always this issue of multiple formats. All that is gone with with the latest versions of, of iWork. Now there's just one format. It's the same whether you're working with it on the Mac, the iOS device, the, the, the iCloud, uh, iWork apps, whatever. And, and not only that, because they, how they modified the apps, how an app looks on one document stays pretty much the same across apps as well. That uh, that if you you don't have to worry anymore that if that if you create something on the on the iWork uh, for the Mac that you'll transfer it to iOS and find that half the things that you created are gone because I, the iOS app doesn't support as much stuff as the iWork app supports. And so that's good as well. That's the positive spin on it. The negative spin, of course, is implied in that last statement, and that is, you know, how did, how did they make it so that the, the Mac version, uh, that translating from the Mac version to the iOS version doesn't lose any features? Well, the way they did that is by eliminating any feature that would have otherwise caused a problem. Uh, and so a whole ton of features that used to be in the 09 versions of the Mac apps uh, are now gone. Uh, and you, you know, I, I, I'm not going to detail them all here. Just go, just go to any article on that subject, and you'll find an endless list of things that you used to be able to do that you can't do anymore for pages, keynote, and numbers. Uh, and even iMovie, too, for that matter. And so that has, that has made lots of people... Um, upset, uh, and the the um, 
the file format issue uh, also, as you're saying, affects your ability to open documents in different um, versions of the app. That is, once you open the document and save it in the new version of iWork, it no longer opens in the old version. So if you, if you wanted to give somebody a copy of a document you're working on and they still have the old version, they won't be able to open it. So that's the other problem that you're referring to. The new format only is no, is no, there's no backward compatibility. The new format only works with, with the new apps. Um, <clears throat> so that can be a problem, but that's, you know, that's, um, that's part of, I mean, Apple essentially, as, as many people have noted, Apple essentially rewrote the apps from the ground up. These are not updated, upgraded, or any up <laughs> of any sort version of the older apps. These are as if Apple said, let's throw out the old version and start completely over. And they wrote a code that's now a matching code between iOS and the Mac uh, so the base code is the same across both platforms, and that's what allows the file format to stay the same. And um, and again, that accomplishes that goal, but it loses those features as a result. Now, if there's some feature, an Apple Script support is a good example of a feature that gets lost in the translation. Uh, all, almost all Apple Script support has been stripped away from the Mac versions. Uh, if that's something that was important to you, if you were using scripting to run a spreadsheet in numbers, for example, and you can't do without it, then you're going to be really pissed off, probably, at the new version of the apps. And um, to some extent, people are saying that give it time. People who want to have the positive spin, give it time. You know, that Apple had to completely rewrite these apps, had to get them out in time for the 2013 release of, of the operating systems. There's only so much they could do, uh, and so they, they they cut some features that that they couldn't manage to to get into both platforms. And over time, those features will come back. And I think that's true to some extent. I don't think it's entirely true. I mean, Apple Script is a good example. I, I'm not counting. In order for Apple Script to be cross cross platform and come back in that way, presumably would mean that the iOS version of the iWork apps would have Apple Script support. Well, there, there isn't any Apple Script support anywhere on the iOS platform right now. They'd have to invent an Apple Script system to run on iOS, which would have all sorts of sandboxing problems because, by its very nature, Apple Script is a, is a program designed to affect apps other than itself, which gets into the whole issue of, of sandbox restrictions. And, and it's a relatively, despite the popularity among the people that use it, it's still, I think, a relative minor, minority of people that use it, and probably even a smaller minority of people that would use it on the iOS platforms, uh, iOS devices, the iPad and the iPhone. And so I don't see Apple planning to, to implement AppleScript on iOS devices anytime soon, if ever. Uh, and, and so I take that to mean that you won't be seeing Apple Script coming back to the Mac platform apps either um, anytime soon. The, the bottom line message that I that I decide is the case for all this is that Apple is making a strategic decision that that the these sort of features, which could be called pro features, features that appeal to a minority of users uh, uh, are okay to dispense with to a large extent. That the market, the, the, the driver of their market right now is the, our mobile devices. The iPad and the iPhone account for what, 75% or more of their revenue. Uh, uh, and, 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 and going up probably. Uh, desktop Macs in particular are a small and smaller percentage of, the, of, the, of their market uh, every, every quarter. Uh, and so I think they're saying, okay, you know, if if there's a feature that that isn't necessary, isn't desirable for our mobile users, then we can chuck it for the Mac as well. Uh, I don't think it's quite that extreme or explicit, but I think that's the direction that Apple is moving in, and and I, I don't think we're going to change it. That would surprise me when it comes to things like Apple Script. Um, I think what you were saying about the features coming back to the iWork apps we have some precedent for that uh because we've seen that with final cut pro we've seen it with imovie where things dropped off and were brought back slowly and and sometimes even improved over what they had been before um apple script i, I your logic is impeccable since there is no scripting on the uh on, on the ios platform it would seem to be a little strange to build it into the Mac platform. On the other hand, they are two different platforms, and for a lot of pro users in a lot of situations, it 
seems to be an essential. So I guess time will just have to tell on that. Well, I'll, add, I'll make a couple of caveats. First, you mentioned Final Cut Pro, and my, re, my response to that is Final Cut Pro is just a Mac program. There is no iOS version of Final Cut Pro. So they don't have to worry about iPhone or iPad compatibility with that app. And yes, they did something quite similar. They rebuilt the app and left off a lot of features initially, and over time they put them back. And I think, like I said, they will do some of that with these iWork apps as well. I just said it's limited how far they're going to go. I'm not saying they're not going to do anything like that. Uh, as far as Apple Script is concerned, I'm not saying they're going to, I didn't mean to imply that they're going to get rid of Apple Script from the Mac entirely, or, or, in any, or certainly not anytime soon. There's a very little cost for them to maintain Apple Script. They can just keep it, maybe even bug fix it, add a new feature or two from time to time. Uh, I'm sure that's fine. It'll allow third-party apps that want to take advantage of Apple Script to do that. Uh, there's no cost to them. There's probably some minimal advantage in terms of satisfying the users that want it that it's still there. So I don't see them in a hurry, hurry to get rid of it. They don't have to. What, uh, what I'm saying is they're not going to worry about it for any of their own apps that have cross-platform compatibility. So you're not going to see it coming back to the iWork apps. You're not going to see it in the iLife apps. You're not going to see it in any other apps that have both Mac and iOS versions. Uh, and I think that's true. And I think that's going to be true. For, uh, I think the watchword is going to be if for apps that have cross-platform um, support, if we can't put it into the iOS version or if we don't want to put it into the iOS version for some reason, we're not going to support it for the Mac version either. Yeah, and uh, you know your point about the the mobile devices driving seventy seventy five percent of Apple's market is indisputable. It, that's where the money is, and that's where the market share is, and that's where everything is right now. So, I guess you got to look at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what else is uh, what else are you working on? Looking toward the next time we get to chat, anything that you can talk about, or is it all deep dark secrets? No, um, I, I don't think we have much time left to talk about anything at length. I am working on uh, another article on um, on the, I, the article on two subjects that we talked about. I think on the Mac jury, I have another article coming out uh, sometime soon on the Mac Pro, uh, and in which the, the the case that I make or try to make, whether I actually make it or not, will depend upon the reader response, I guess, uh, that I try to make is that the Mac Pro has become too expensive for the, many of the users that have older Mac Pros to want to upgrade to. Uh, it, it will appeal to the people who absolutely need it, you know, the people that work for Pixar that want a Mac Pro uh, to, to do whatever it is they're going to do over there with their video rendering. Um, some of them may want it. Uh, the video pr production people in general, uh, f heavy Photoshop users, whatever, um, <clears throat> they may, they will, people who depend on it for a living in one sense or another and, and can afford to get it or who have a company that can afford to pay for it for them will get it. But there was a segment of the Mac Pro market of which I include myself, and probably you for a while, I don't think you have a Mac Pro anymore, uh, that, that treated the Mac Pro as what I called an affordable luxury. That is, it was, it was better than the iMac in significant ways. It was faster than the iMac. It had the internal support for multiple drives and multiple optical drives, and, uh, and you could slap in PCI cards, and you could do all these things that you couldn't do with the iMac. You could drive multiple displays. Uh, and, and so for, for the added price, which could have been 1000 or $2,000 more than an iMac, probably closer to $2,000 more than an iMac, uh, it was, it, it, for, for those people like myself, it was worth getting because of all the extra stuff that you got. Well, two things have changed. I think one thing that has changed is that the iMac has gotten considerably better. For most people, for instance, the, the extra speed that you get, for most mortal people, you know, not, not these video and graphic professionals, but, but for people like myself who, who spend most of the day surfing the web and writing articles, uh, uh, the, the speed of an iMac is more than sufficient for anything I need to do. I'm not going to get any big advantage out of the super speed that I'm going to get from the Mac Pro. And at the same time, the cost of the Mac Pro has gone up. Uh, and the um, the big one of the bigger the biggest drivers of that I, I did a calculation of what it would cost me to get a Mac Pro at, at some minimal configuration. I started with the four core model, the cheapest Mac Pro that you can get, uh, and and worked on what I needed. And the, one of the biggest 
the things that, that I discovered was that the Mac Pro only comes with 256 gigabytes of flash storage, which is ridiculous. Even if you get the $4,000 upgraded six-core model, it still comes with 256 gigabytes of flash storage. Nobody using that machine is going to want to be satisfied with 256 gigabytes. My, 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 uh, my MacBook has more than 256 gigabytes, I think, and certainly my iMac does, uh, and any new iMac that you would buy today comes with at least one terabyte of stor storage uh, for most people. The, the, I think the most popular configuration is probably the one terabyte Fusion Drive, which, which is, is really great. Uh, and so in order to get, since there is no fusion drive that you can get for the Mac Pro or, or anything like it, the only way you can get one terabyte of storage is to get a one terabyte flash storage, which adds an extra $800 to the cost of the machine. That is what I'm estimating based on, on what it costs for, for a Mac, uh, for an iMac. Um, and so when I did estimates like that to try to figure out what a minimal acceptable configuration would be for me, it was going to cost me well over $6,000 to get a Mac Pro, and that's the cheapest base unit. Well, there's no way that I'm going to spend $6,500 for a Mac Pro. I just don't need it. Uh, I could get three iMacs for that price. Uh, so uh, essentially, Apple has priced the iMac out of my acceptable price range, and I think that that's going to be true for a whole segment of people like myself that used to get Mac Pros. Yeah, I, you know, I can't, I can't argue with you, but I guess I'm not really terribly surprised at that pricing, just because it's, it's a pro machine, and I guess I'm, I'm going to try to play devil's advocate, or maybe I'm an Apple shill, I don't know which, but the iMac that you can purchase now is the equivalent or more than the Mac Pro you have sitting under your desk, with the exception, of course, of the PCI cards and you know all of that. Um, but you're not going to have that in the new Mac Pro anyway. And I feel like they, what they did is they really stripped this down. They created a pro-level machine that eh, has a pro-level price, and that's it. And for, for everybody else, the people that fancy themselves power users, the iMac is probably good enough if they, if they will look at it that way. Well, I don't disagree with you. I, I don't think you're playing devil's advocate. I'm, I'm not saying that Apple shouldn't charge that much or that maybe or that the components inside a, a, a Mac Pro aren't worth that much. Uh, I'm just saying that by going the way that they did, they've left me out of the market, and I don't, I don't think Apple cares. <laughs> so, so I, I'm, I'm not suggesting they should worry about the fact that they've left me out of the market. I think they probably know going in that people like me are unlikely to upgrade to a Mac Pro, and they're perfectly okay with that. Uh, I think it um, is, is a continuation of their of, of the trend that we've talked about, that the, of the mobile devices driving their their decisions, and if if half the people that used to buy a Mac Pro buy the new Mac Pro, I think they'll be perfectly fine with that. It's it's not a big driver of, of, of concern for them. And the other thing I'll mention is that I actually find you, know, you mentioned that the Mac Pro doesn't allow for internal expansion. Uh, and I actually find that another negative of the Mac Pro. Essentially, that was one of the biggest reasons. I preferred a Mac Pro over an iMac with all that internal expansion. If you eliminate that, yeah, it becomes a very super fast, power Whoa. it becomes a very super fast, powerful uh, um, machine. Uh, but now I have to have all the external, I have to have all of what used to be internal peripherals as external peripherals sitting next to it. Uh, and in that sense, it's no different than an iMac again. I would have had to do the same thing with an iMac. And so it just becomes another reason for me not to really want to get a Mac Pro, especially at the price I'm going to have to pay. Yeah, six thousand is is a healthy little chunk of change, like you said. That's three iMacs, yeah. or, or at least two very, very, very nicely configured iMacs. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, to be fair, I I included in that price just so people are wondering where I got the six thousand dollars. The cost of a display, because of course the Mac Pro doesn't come with a display. The iMac does. So if I was considering getting a Mac Pro versus an iMac, then I'd have to include the cost of a display, and so I went with the um, I went with Apple's Thunderbolt display, which is not the cheapest the display you could get. But I'm figuring, okay, let's stay all Apple uh, for the comparison here, and so that adds another thousand dollars to the cost of the Mac Pro right there. So you add the 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 thousand dollar Thunderbolt display, eight hundred dollars at least for the for the flash storage, and you're already almost two thousand dollars over the starting. 
price, a $3,000 starting price, is, when you compare it to what it would cost for uh, something like an iMac, uh, and I'm not saying you're getting the same thing, I want to be clear, but, but when you're just looking at the cost numbers, it's clear that it's going to be a lot more than the $3,000. Oh my goodness, this is an opinion poll calling out. <laughs> Everyone wants to get in on this session. Apparently. Everybody wants their opinion, Ted. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, give them my opinion, but I'm not sure they're going to like it. Yeah. So. <laughs> and we we don't want the adult tag here. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Ted, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much. I, I get the impression that the sun has gone down there because it's gotten noticeably darker behind you. So. Yes, yes. Well, we're on standard time now. So. Yeah. It's getting dark earlier. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's good to see you, and we'll be we'll be doing this again shortly. And maybe by that maybe by that time you'll have the new iPad, whatever it is, in hand. Yeah, and my Mac Pro that I'll suddenly decide to get for eight thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm, I'm frankly I'm I'm going to start taking bets on how long it'll take you before you get the Mac Pro. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Dad, thanks a lot. Okay. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. He's Ted Landau, and we've had a lot of fun talking to you this time. Please check our show notes for the articles to uh, the, to the links to articles that Ted has uh, included, and we'll be back again soon. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.